Well, g'day. That's Australian for, um, hey. How's the teleprompter doing? We've got good day. Can we get a G apostrophe day? Wait for it, wait for it. Yeah! Last, last time I got in trouble because um, I spoke in Japanese and the teleprompter wasn't all that uh, crash hot on that. Should we try again? Yeah. <laughs> Konnichiwa. Hari nan desu ka? Hai. Genki desu. Origoto gozaimasu. Well played, teleprompter, well played. <laughs> this is my mate, Kai, um, and I'm gonna try and talk about Kai without crying. And I've already nearly started. <laughs> this is uh, just after Kai's baptism. Um, Kai chose to get baptized like you lot get baptized after he heard about your triune pattern. In fact, we did a series uh, in our church uh, on baptism. We talked about how the Syrian uh, church, the early church, that they would uh, strip off naked and they would get in the waters of baptism and on the other side, they'll be given new clothes. And we talked about you lot and how you lot dunk in that triune pattern. And Kai came to me and, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and Kai <laughs> came to me and he said, Jared, I want to get baptized naked and I want to do it three dunks. I said, Kai, there's no way I'm getting in the water with you naked, but we can do the three dunks. <laughs> Kai's background, Kai and I met doing climate activism. Kai and I met doing end poverty movement in Australia. And Kai's story is uh, as convoluted as all of ours often are. As Kai tells it, one of the things that put him on this journey to come into Christ was uh, being out with his mates and he was drunk and he was at the casino and uh, his mates are a pretty rough kind of crowd, and they were out the front, and uh, they just started like laying in, just making fun of, like ripping into, but in a really harsh way, really harsh way, this prostitute, this street worker. And what came up for Kai, and <laughs> it's amazing what God uses, but what came up for Kai was, uh, any Kanye West fans? Yeah, I'm not sure that's a good thing. Uh, pray for that brother and his misogyny. But you know the, the song, uh, Jesus Walks, yeah? So there's this verse uh, that goes um, to all the hustlers, killers, murders, drug dealers, even strippers. Jesus walks with them. That's probably a good thing that you don't know what the rest of it was. Jesus walks with them. And Kai's out with his mates and he sees his mates picking on this poor woman whose situation is so desperate that she's selling her body. And Kai steps in because, in his words, God spoke to him through Kanye West. And he intervened and he was like, no, 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 th this isn't cool. And this started a division with his mates. And this also meant that Kai came to me and said, uh, I love what you guys are doing and, and I want to get in on it. There was something about Kai looking at our little family and the way that we live and our activism that Kai said, I'm interested in a spirituality that is good news for creation. I'm interested in a spirituality which is good news for the poor. And he said, this Kanye West experience, I, I want to talk to you about it. So Kai and I, uh, he came to church with us, started uh, joining a Bible study with us, and um, uh, Kai gave his life to Christ, and uh, I, I hugged him afterwards, and we're, we're walking out of, of uh, the church building, and Kai gets a phone call, and on the phone is the same group of mates that he was fighting with at the casino, and he hadn't gone to the party the night before, he had hung out at our place and actually uh, um, served people instead. But the phone call is that one of his mates that was there with him that night at the casino, that would have been at the party if he had gone to it the night before, had been murdered by a rival group and he'd had his throat slit. And I didn't know which way it was going to go for Kai. Kai is in tears and he just walks up to me and he gives me this big hug and he pulls back. And I don't know what he's going to say, particularly after that kind of tragedy, after that kind of pain. And Kai's response is, this is why I want to follow Jesus. I don't want this to be my story anymore. So Kai, as he put it, and I love this quote, and 
Kai and I have been arrested a number of times together. In fact, part of Kai's journey, um, in, term, in a good way, in a Christ-like way, in a causing Christ-like trouble kind of way. <laughs> Kai's journey to this was actually after his first arrestable action and reflecting with other Christians as they were praying in this action and the way that they carried themselves with this kind of non-violence that loved even the police officers that was arresting them. And, and Kai said, I want some of that. Kai sent me a text message and he goes, in the Catholic high school that he was a part of, so that was the only experience of Christianity he had, he heard about the Son of God in the manger and he heard, in his words, the martyred lamb on the cross. But he said, it's only hanging out with you mob I've ever heard anything about this revolutionary that lived in between those two points. Kai's words, I want to become a born again Anabaptist. I know you're brethren, but if anybody wants to give me an amen, then now's your time. Thank you, thank you. I want to become a born-again Anabaptist. And it was his language around born-again that he wanted that personal transformation and his language about Anabaptism that meant that I started talking about your tradition and what we've learned because your beautiful tradition brings together what the fancy uh, peeps who know stuff about theology and history will call pietism and they'll also say Anabaptism. But this personal experience, this mystical experience of the risen Jesus, with this sense of we're called to his radical nonviolence. And so Kai got baptized in the pattern of your church, and we've started as a church community in Australia after I hung out with you, Mob, is he got out of the waters of baptism, and then he had two people wash his feet, like I've learned from you. And then, yeah, isn't that amazing? Kai had his feet washed by two leaders that he can look up to in our community and then he washed their feet. And they passed him the towel and they said, Kai, with this sign of a towel, we now conquer, no longer with a sword. And all of that has been inspired by you, Mob. Kai summed up why he became a Christian like this. It's the radical love stuff. That's why I became a Christian. The fighting with love. Did you hear that? Fighting with love. Do you know, um, last week I spent it with Jim Lawson. Anybody know who Jim Lawson is? Stan, I see that hand. Um, Jim Lawson, Martin Luther King had read a whole bunch about nonviolence, but it wasn't until he went to one of Jim Lawson's trainings that he had actually experienced a nonviolent training. I spent a week with Jim Lawson, the man that, who Martin Luther King, on the eve of his assassination, said that Jim Lawson was the greatest strategist and tactician of nonviolence in the world. Is, is that not phenomenal? And Jim Lawson insists that what's at the root of Jesus' teaching isn't some dry pacifism, but is instead this radical power, this power of love, this love which Kai is talking about here, fighting with love, double victory stuff. Now, does anybody know what I mean by double victory? Anybody know who Kai is quoting? See, Kai, because he's interested in what's at the root of your tradition, what the genesis of your tradition were, those early dunker punks, <laughs> is this sense of double victory. So Martin Luther King put it like this, not only will we win our own freedom, but we will so appeal to your hearts and minds that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. Kai realizes the pietism of your tradition, that God has won a double victory in him. Not only has God got a new activist, but God's got a new life transformed. Kai knows what he's been saved from, and he's discovering and following Jesus what he's saved for. That's a double victory that he has seen in his own life. He goes on, it's revolutionary stuff. That's how God loves me. That's how I can love others? That does my head in. I wish you could meet Kai. He's this big Brazilian, burly, he's an awesome dude. Maybe four years' time we can bring him with us. That, that would be fun. But Kai's connection is sadly lost on a lot of you crew who I've been hanging out with. And I want to firstly say I appreciate those who have been so kind to me and uh, not knowing who I was, said g'day because, uh, well, you didn't say g'day, you said hey or sup or something like that. Um, 
not knowing who I was and included me. That speaks to me of you understand these two sides of this tradition. But there's a bunch of crew who are here that don't, and I find it tragic. See, why our outsiders, us outsiders, we're looking at you, Mob, and going, we want to learn from that. That's phenomenal. I find talking to a bunch of you lot that, A, you might not know about it, or B, not, might not even appreciate it. See, what's at the origins of your tradition is this mustard seed revolution stuff, and it's got nothing to do with how you heard about it in Sunday school. Now, I know in Sunday school it preaches well that something small, and then it grew, grew into this large tree, and that's wonderful, and you might be something small, but one day you can be something really great as well. And like Desmond Tutu says, I too suffer from wanting to be liked and I want to kind of give that message that, hey, you can be all that you can be. One day you can be president and all that other stuff you get told in this country, which isn't true. Like, <laughs> but, but it's not actually going on here. That's not what this text is about. If Jesus wanted to tell that kind of story, and that's the kind of story that Jesus' listeners want to say amen to, that would get everybody Jesus is talking to on the side. This is an oppressed people that are waiting for hope, for freedom from their oppressors. And Jesus would have said, the kingdom of heaven is like the cedars of Lebanon. You lot might say it's like a Yosemite National Park's forest. It's majestic and massive and people come in awe of it and everybody would have said amen because we like that and especially you lot and especially us lot we we love success we love those stories of something little that becomes something big and i'm sorry for those who are like i really hope jared gives us something inspirational like that like i want to but it's just not what's going on in the text if we pay attention jesus is actually telling a story not about the grandeur of Yosemite, but he's actually telling a story about weeds. Now, I know we're in Colorado, not that kind of weed. <laughs> and no, I haven't, despite the dreadlocks. Thanks for asking. <laughs> but Jesus is telling a story like um, rabbis at the time, rabbinical teaching said, don't plant mustard in your garden because mustard takes over. See, it says it becomes a bush and the bush grows and grows and becomes like a tree. But, I mean, either Jesus has like got a really bad thumb and, you know, God's the creator, so I don't think he does. Like, green thumb Jesus has, he knows what he's talking about. He's not saying it becomes a large tree in the sense of like it's like Yosemite, but it's a weed that grows and grows and grows and grows and it grows about this high but it just takes over everything. See, the other interesting thing about mustard is mustard in the ancient world was a sign of power. But mustard's power isn't released unless it's what? Crushed. So Jesus is telling this subversive story, not about heaven somewhere else, but how heaven's coming here. So what this looks like is a bit like this. The disciples, they're walking around with Jesus, and Jesus is just moving through the crowd. And Jesus says, follow me. What's your name? Caleb, I'm Jared. Follow me. And this is how it worked. Now, some of you are going, what is it to be called? I don't know what my call is. And a lot of people have been talking about calls the whole time, and Caleb's going, what have I just been called to? <laughs> Following around the Australian, what, what's going on here? Can I just say, g'day. I'm not sure what some people mean when they talk about being called, other than what Caleb's doing right now, following. Your main call is to follow Jesus. So in fact, if we were just to sum it up, maybe with the Great Commission, who knows it by heart? Matthew 28, verse 18. Yes, we got all the way to the end. Caleb, okay, you still with me? So a disciple is one who follows, and one who follows literally means they walk like their rabbi walks. So if I start going like this, the command to therefore go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do what? Obey. Now, Caleb, when we were talking about the pietist tradition and the Anabaptist tradition, Anabaptists are big on the obey. So that's you, Mob. 
And you might have been really good at that. But the next verse goes on to talk about not just obedience, but who is with us always? Jesus. So it's not just about obedience, but presence. There's the other half of your tradition. This is what us outsiders are learning from. So as Caleb follows me, as he's walk, walking, as his uh, just rabbi is walking, he is copying. How are you going, Caleb? Good. You having fun yet? But of course, Jesus isn't telling them to skip around the place. He's saying what? Like, let's imagine, I don't know, Matthew summarized in three chapters. You still with me? Three chapters. Maybe if you could put it between Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, that actually summarized all the teachings. And maybe scholars would say that this was so central to the early church that many people would memorize these passages before they got into the waters of baptism. Caleb, you did great. Thank you. Thanks, bro. Of course, I'm talking about what that was so central to Anna Margaret Mack and Alexander Mack. Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount ends with these words. So where are we? Chapter 7 verse 24. Those who hear these words of mine and do what? Put them into practice are like a wise person who builds their house upon a... Now, I don't know what you've heard in different preaching about what we're to build our house upon. I've heard a lot of stuff of our understanding of the cross or our understanding of what happens at the end. But Jesus concludes Here's what discipleship is. And he sums it up by saying, if you do this, you're like what? A wise person. Do you know Gandhi spent an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening meditating on the Sermon on the Mount? Do you know Gandhi could recite all three chapters from memory? Gandhi, of course, was he Christian? Gandhi was a what? Gandhi said things like, I like your Christ, but not you Christians. You Christians are nothing like your Christ. And it's not that Gandhi couldn't find Christians that took Jesus seriously. He just couldn't find Christians that took Jesus as seriously as he did. Gandhi was asked over and over and over again what was central to his revolution in India. He always answered the Bhagavad Gita and Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount. Now you mob, you brethren mob, this is the genesis. This is built into the DNA of the genesis of your movement, the Sermon on the Mount. Out of interest, who knows the Sermon on the Mount off by heart? Yeah, I'm struggling to get there as well. Here's the thing though, what Kai and I are interested in and why we're learning from your tradition is this early mob did. This early mob, the Dunkers as they were called, you've heard that term before? Let's start with another definition. Punk, a young person, especially a member of a rebellious countercultural group. That's what your early movement was. Dunkers, a movement starting in 1708 in Germany with Anna Margaret Mack, Alexander Mack, and six other, others that were a creative, courageous, compassionate fusion of Anabaptism and radical pietism. That's what we're learning from you, mob, but you, mob, often don't know the gift that you've been given. So what I want to do with the rest of my time is I want to tell a little bit of a story about what it might look like to actually become a dunker punk. Because you can be Church of Brethren and people ask you questions like, oh, Gingrich, that's a good Church of the Brethren name, but dunker punks know that Rodriguez and Johnson and Chang are good dunker punk names too. See, those who relate to the tradition merely as a tradition and are, ask questions about brethrenism in terms of like, who are you related to the, in the tradition? Miss the fact that dunker punks are about how do you embody and relate to the tradition? Can you hear the difference? See, those who want to do either, and uh, I might get in trouble for this, but a Southern Baptist version of pacifism, or a Unitarian, we like your talk of social justice and spirituality version of pacifism. Miss the radical edge of this tradition where people gather around the scriptures 
and treat them authoritatively while reading them through the life of Jesus, while in prayer being sensitive to the Spirit and obey everything he's commanded, attentive to his Spirit that's on the move. This is what the Dunkerpunk revolution is about. And guess what? The mustard seed conspiracy, the mustard seed revolution is this Dunkerpunk revolution. Your tradition is only good for the world in as much as it looks like Jesus. And it does. And so many of you are ready to pass it up and pass it over instead of do the work of what is the fusion of God's presence and radical obedience and realizing that in grace. Your work, and there were only eight people who did this initial baptism and what they were like, let's draw straws, who's going first because we don't want it to be about us. They're people who understand the mustard seed revolution. They're people that understand that it's not about them. It's not about becoming the cedars of Lebanon. But God, for some reason, doesn't rescue us through empires or through kings like we expect a king. But Jesus comes and he is what? Crushed. Now I'm going to talk about the cross. And I'll, I know some of you are like, whoa, we're brethren, don't mention sin. That's what the reform crew do. We, we just talk about peace. No, not if you hang out with this mob. They talked about sin. I'm not talking about individual sins. I'm talking about sin. I'm talking about that reality that we're all enculturated in that means everybody look at their shoes. Where were they made? Exactly. Welcome to sin. Our lives depend on the cruelty of others. Our lives depend on slavery. 27 million slaves in the world today and a dunker punk revolution has something to witness to a different world other than that reality. Only eight people were a part of the start of this. I'm only looking for eight people to respond tonight. That's all we need. We've got a historical precedent. I mean, sure, 12 disciples, but we've just got eight with your tradition. God just wants eight of you to sign up to the dunker punk revolution. Now, I know some of you are like, well, my ancestors came out as migrants and I'm part of the brethren. I'm more brethren. I don't care. <laughs> this early movement was about radical presence and radical obedience. So, I'm going to share some stories and then I'm going to bring it back to Kai. And I really would only be more than delighted if eight of you responded. But it's going to be a very simple question. Jesus was crushed. Not by God. <laughs> God didn't crush Jesus so he doesn't have to crush you. That's not the gospel. God was crushed in Jesus by us. And yet he raises with forgiveness and offers us this new way. You know how I talked about Kai and how he was in that situation with the street worker and he stepped in and said, this isn't right. Kai reflecting on that after studying what happened and, and reading the crucifixion stories and everything, and Kai goes, I didn't know it at the time, but what I did for that woman, Jesus has done for me. Jesus has stepped in those places that were otherwise toxic and Jesus has taken that shame and that guilt and stood in that place for me. And now I can do that for others. So I'm gonna do a little bit of storytelling for what that's looked like in our life, here's a little bit of what the mustard seed revolution looks like at my home. It's not all that exciting, but it is a lot of fun. Bike lessons. Teaching recently uh, arrived kids how to speak English, and here's us actually learning Ken, Ken Rwanda at the same time, playing games and doing homework. But there's more to the story of that than that. So first home project, we actually live with 17 recently arrived refugees. You can see over here it says, no way. That's the actual ad that the Australian government sends to the world. We have the most barbaric responses to immigrants in the world. If you arrive by boat, you will be detained indefinitely. I have friends that have spent four or five years in detention. And we're actually bullying small nations like Nauru, Papua New Guinea, Christmas Island, Cambodia. And you know Cambodia's human rights record? It ain't good. And we're saying, if you don't take our refugees, we won't give you our aid money. But we're called to take part in this mustard seed revolution that isn't about us. And so our little family responded to God's call in our life and started this community that actually welcomes them. 
So you can see here, this is my gorgeous boy, Tyson. He's 17. Yes, ladies, he is single. <laughs> Six foot four now. I know what you're thinking. Tall, dark, handsome. But Jared, short, fair, odd looking. That's another testimony for another night. <laughs> this is my gorgeous wife, Teresa. Um, she is phenomenal. I hope you get to meet her. Some She's just been nominated for West Australian of the Year. We told that to some of the families we live with. And they said, no, why would they nominate Teresa for Worst Australian? No, 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 not Worst Australian, West Australian of the Year for her work with First Home Project. And I want to give you a sense of this mustard seed revolution and what it looks like in, in practice and tell some stories of the privilege of these people that we get to live with. See, the mustard seed revolution is Jesus does for us what we can't do for ourselves. So I am not Agnes's white saviour, and I know what you're thinking. It's like, well, in terms of like white saviours, maybe Jared would make a pretty... <laughs> Agnes doesn't need a white saviour. She's got a black one. His name's Jesus, and she loves him dearly. It's the same one we've all got. She loves him dearly. Let me tell you a little bit of something about Agnes and why it's so exceptional that she loves our Lord so dearly. You see here her cute little kid, Safoni. Agnes had another four-year-old that in the Great Water of Africa had his li her life taken in front of Agnes with a machete. And you, you watch how Agnes dances and worships and I, I don't understand that kind of faith. Agnes, get a little bit of a sense of her. Agnes, when, when Agnes was 10 years old, she was told by her father that you can't go to school anymore, that you have to uh, stay home and milk the goat and help around the house. Agnes, in response, she started to, on the way to school, she would pick mushrooms, and then uh, once she got to school, she would hide them in our book bag, and then she'd finish her chores earlier on a Saturday morning, and then she'd run down to the markets and sell the mushrooms. Selling the mushrooms, Agnes made enough money that at the end of the year, she was able to run away to neighbouring Rwanda with the money that she saved and pay her way through her education. This is how resourceful and awesome my neighbour Agnes is. This is why she doesn't need a saviour. All she needs is somebody who's willing to give her a fair go. That's an Australian way of saying just a little bit of justice. Let me give you a sense of uh, Sofo, little Sofo, cutest kid ever. You see him here with uh, my son Tyson. Sofoni was walking uh, down to the chemist. I guess you guys would say drugstore. Drugstore? We wouldn't say drugstore. That means something different at home. Um, <laughs> walk, walking down, and they walk in and they fill up the script and uh, Agnes gets what she needs. And while filling out the script, the, uh, Sofo was playing the uh, which hand is the coin in game. He's like, no, no. And it's the eternal game of which hand is the coin in because he doesn't have a coin. So he's like, no, 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 no. He's having the best time ever. And this old fellow walks up to Sofo and says, where are you from, young man? And Sofo looks up at him. Obviously, as you can see, he looks like any kid that came from that part of Africa, but he straightens his back in a loud voice. He says, I am from China. These are these wonderful people that I have the privilege of living with. And if you're part of the First Home Project Facebook page, you'd probably see these photos like cycle through um, from our beautiful friends from Afghanistan and, and from the Congo. But I want to tell you the story that lies behind this and how it fits with the mustard seed revolution. See, what this place was before we did it up, it was literally a meth lab. I mean, you could have filmed Breaking Brad there. It, it was an actual drug lab. It was built in the 70s as a four-square gospel church. It was renovated and, and became an Aboriginal community centre. And then it became uh, a centre uh, uh, and, and homes. And then it was abandoned. And it just sat there as a drug lab. And so this place came up for offer. And we made an offer on the place. We left our ministry and everything we thought what we had been a part of was our life. And we went... And at 9.05, we went and put an offer on this place. Now, as you can see, uh, we had a lot of renovating to do. And in fact, Teresa was lifting up these tiles and uh, she thought it was a cat jumping at her. And it was actually a mummified rat, the meth. 
had like mummified this rat that fell on her. So we, we had a, a, a lot of work to do. 905, we put an offer on this place. Huge step of faith for us. Uh, we drive up to my parents' place because my mum drives trucks. How cool is my mum? So, um, <laughs> as well as being a trained nurse, my mum drives trucks. And the reason why, and you talk about God's active presence in our lives and finding our call in the general call of what it is to follow Jesus. As we get busy doing the stuff we find in the Sermon on the Mount, letting your yes be yes, loving God with all you got and loving your neighbor as yourself, loving your enemies, as we get busy just doing the basics of discipleship, you will find your particular call as you follow Jesus. Can you hear that? Because I've talked to some of you and some of you is totally stressing out about it. And what, what we did is we responded to that call on our lives to buy this place and we drove up to my mum's place, I opened up my laptop and I saw there that um, I had an email uh, and I was like, well, I've got the day off work, I better quickly check it. It's from a mate that's on the other side of the country who says, uh, my wife and I are feeling called to leave our ministry. And I was like, that's amazing, that's exactly what we've done today. It's sent within five minutes of us making an offer in the place. It goes on to say, to start a house for immigrants, for refugees. And I'm like, what? I'm like, totally freaked out. I go, Teresa, mum, dad, come read this. I get a phone call. I leave the room. I come back 15 minutes later. There is another email. I didn't see that there was another friend who had also been tagged in it. Other friends responded, he's in Adelaide. He responds and says, our church community are also feeling called to start a prophetic work that shows Christian welcome and hospitality as an alternative to the cruelty that our nation is showing to these desperate people. And so I'm like completely spinning out right, like talk about confirmation, talk about a sense of God's active presence. So I'm like I'm flipping out. We then go get in the truck that my mum's driving because a bank had contacted us, said that they got 14 stories of furniture that they're wanting to give away. And they provided the truck for us to come and take it for free. On that day when we stepped out in faith and took part in this mustard seed revolution, we fully furnished all three apartments with the exceptions of beds. Isn't that not incredible? And so, <laughs> at lunchtime, a friend disappears, comes back with an envelope, unbeknownst to us, being to the bank, $5,000, hands it to us and says, I'm just feeling called to share this with you. And so we're like, wow, God's so at work. This is incredible. As you can see down here, it looks like we didn't ram raid at Ikea or something. Like it's like, but we had to be backed by a bank. And week after week went by, three weeks went by and it was a Tuesday. And we're expecting for a bank to come through and say, we will back you. Only no bank had come through. And so I'm driving with my brother-in-law. He's not a Christian. Uh, I was talking to a, a young fella who um, uh, came to Christ this last year and he was saying that his parents are atheists. Well, I mean, that's most of Australia and the beautiful thing about that is you get to live your life with such love that they get to see what Christianity is really about instead of some of the ways that it's often portrayed in this nation and mine. And so I'm driving with my brother-in-law and I get this call and I'm expecting it to be the bank. We've got people praying, we've stepped out in faith, we're like, God is at work and the call says we've been rejected. 14 different banking institutions rejected us for a loan. And it's it, it's over. $10,000 deposit and it's gone. Left our ministry and we can't go back. He's not a Christian and Jay says to me, but what about all the God stuff? What about all that freaky stuff that happened? pulls over and he lets me out and I jump on the train and I'm crying on public transport, which is always awkward. <laughs> and I get a phone call from my mate Josh Kelsey, who's now church planning in Brooklyn. And Josh goes, you got it. And I'm like, nah, Josh, we didn't. And Josh being the great disciple that he is, who takes obedience and presence seriously, who takes the Sermon on the Mount seriously, who realizes he's part of a mustard seed revolution instead of a Seder tree revolution, Josh says, let's pray. If you wanna live a safe life, stop praying. It'll mess you up. 
Josh starts praying and Josh has a word for us that this is a Lazarus moment and though it seems like everything is dead and there is no way forward, that God would make a way and that we need to trust that we'd see God's glory in the 11th hour. Here's what I gotta deal with though. I have the biggest speaking gig of my life. I am backstage with Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins, Alana Del Rey, I'm, I'm there with Kimbra, block party, I have free access to um, uh, VIP tickets backstage. And I need to either trust Josh's word that everything's not over and I'm feeling so depressed, or I can just stay and have an amazing, amazing time. I went home early. And with this video that we're about to watch, we launched a campaign where in 14 days, we crowdsourced for the first time in history our mortgage. It made print and TV media as far away as Albania and Kosovo. This is the video that we did it with. You ready to go, comrade? Yeah. Jared and Teresa, I admire because they're two young people um, who've got the ideal that uh, they should put other people first. Like many Aussies our age, we want to buy our first home. Maybe a bit different to other people's first homes, our first home will be their first home too. Jared and, and, and Teresa are trying to do something that I dearly would love to do and that is to um, not only wish that they could provide shelter for people at risk, but they actually intend to do it. But the intention is um, a bit on the rocks because they need people to back them up. It's important that we welcome the new Aussies and give them a fair go. Extraordinary young couple whose uh, real uh, commitment is to make love practical. They've done that in ways of uh, caring for Indigenous, uh, being involved with asylum seekers and refugees. And uh, I am a great admirer of what they do now. They're at a crossroads. So our little family are feeling moved to come alongside the newest Australians so they can have a fair go to. So we put in an offer for our first home, not just for us, but for new Aussie families too. It was accepted by the owner, yet lenders are finding it hard to understand what we're about and aren't prepared to give us a loan. And that's why we're making this video to appeal to people to actually invest in this magnificent act of self-sacrifice. They don't see this as a home, despite the fact that it's zoned residential, it has enough bedrooms, bathrooms and kitchens for three families, which is perfect for us and our new friends. So in short, the banks have said we don't get it and we thought it was all over. Then a friend gave us $5,000 and said, we can't do what you're doing, but we can give. Then a mate rings up, says we've got about $40,000 that they've been saving for their own home. Says we love you, we love what you're trying to do for others and we want to support you by lending this money to you. Then someone else said we're 55 grand that we're prepared to lend you to help your dream become a reality. Then we realise the banks might not get it, but maybe you do. Maybe you want to be our bank. So we met with a lawyer and accountant who said, look, it's different but it's possible. So we're asking, do you two want to be our bank? We need to come up with 600,000 by either loan or donation by Sunday the 12th of August. We've never asked or taken donations before. Jared and Teresa's uh, philosophy is pretty simple. It is love is practical. Nothing more practical than what they're trying to do. Uh, practical in the sense that it's a hand up, not just a handout. Practical in the sense that it's about education and belonging and hospitality and empowerment. So uh, let's help them with their, their philosophy and be practical too. So this is a place and with a hand from you, we can give a hand up to the newest Australians. It's, uh, because it's backed up by two honest blokes like you and me, mm. uh, 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 well, the <laughs> We're giving a guarantee, a personal moral guarantee, aren't we? Absolutely. That this is, uh, I was going to say that this is a good bet, but I mean, I'm paying yeah. respect to your... To a your Costello own. and a Maguire, you can trust that. Yes! <laughs> the double. <laughs> They'll cut an edit. Yeah, they can cut an edit, yeah.
So armed only with that video, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, in 14 days, this is what went down. Nine days to go, 350,000 left to go. Oh, and by the way, six days, 335,000, that roughly translates into American money as 335,000. So we're dealing with serious amount of money, right? Five hours, 46,296 to go. Do you remember Josh's word? That God's glory shines the brightest in the 11th hour and that we need to trust that this is a resurrection moment. And though it might look like everything is dead, that God will make a way. USA versus Spain was trending on Twitter, so we just threw it in the photo and I hope that more people might see it and use the hashtag one hour to go, $34,000 to go. 15 minutes, 21,725 to go. And the next thing everybody else saw was this. What people didn't know is in the last five minutes, what happened is a woman on the East Coast rang and she said, oh, hi. I just saw this on Facebook and I thought, oh, that's something I'd really like to contribute to, but, you know, it's two hours gone now, so I'm late. And I'm like, hurry up. It's five minutes to go. Why are you wasting my time? And she's like, then I caught on. She said, like, two hours ago. And I'm like, no, no, like, no, no, no. We're in Perth. It was still five minutes to go. Her words, but I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me to ring Anyway, she gave $200 more than we needed in the last two minutes. And so I literally fell to the floor and just cried. And I picked myself up and I looked back at my computer and the computer literally said, four, five, nine, there was one minute to go. So the first thing I did is get on the phone to Josh and I'm like, forget 11th hour, try 11th hour and 59th minute. But the next thing that everybody saw that has made a prophetic difference in Australia, our little family of three called on the eve of the last election to ask the then Prime Minister about these issues from our house. And the reason is, if we're obedient and trust in that presence, these things that are at the DNA of your movement, God is at work and we can take part in this dunker punk mustard seed revolution. The next thing everybody saw was this, It was Tyson's idea to get Ron Burgundy to break the news. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Breaking news. We have a home and the community has a heart. We have seen, yeah. (laughs) We have seen two families already graduate from being with, with us that have gone from homelessness one to owning their own home and renting. And it's because of these little mustard seed initiatives that have got nothing to do with us or our grandeur, but it's got everything to do with what's at the base of your tradition. So here's my working definition. A dunker punk or dunker punks are young people who are members of a rebellious countercultural tradition that radically commits their life to living God's Calvary-shaped love in the power of the Spirit to the glory of the Father. This isn't merely about abstract ideas about peace. This isn't about ideas of, and strategies of social change. This is what it is to actually undergo and live that radical love that those of us elsewhere, we're looking to your history and going, we want in on that. And a simple invitation this evening. No music, no band, no smoke machine, no manipulation. I'm looking for eight dunker punks. I'm looking for eight people who'd be willing to make a stand and say, I want to be a part of that original revolution. I want to be a part of that mustard seed revolution. I want to be a part of this beautiful tradition that is at the heart of who you are and yet so many people are ready to give it up for something else. So for one minute, I'm just going to ask if we can sit in silence. And then I'm going to stand. And I'm going to stand down here. And even if it's just eight people that want to stand with me, I'm asking, 
Who's up for the mustard seed revolution? I'm asking. Who's up for being a dunker punk? I'm asking. Who's up for a life of radical love where our obedience is found in God's very presence? One minute, silence. And then I invite you, if anybody feels called, to join me. Lord Jesus, may we lose our lives in your radical love. Lord, for those who are feeling stirred, give them the courage to make a stand. Amen. Who's in? I want to ask that you'd put an arm around someone you're next to. One of the beautiful things about your tradition is that you insist that discipleship isn't a solo journey, but that it takes a community. If you are serious about the mustard seed revolution, you will need the people next to you. If you are serious about becoming a dunker punk, it will only take one or two other people maybe in your congregation that you can find that can hold you accountable because other people will want to do something different than obedience in the presence of God. So we need each other. So I'm going to pray and then scattered throughout this place, there are people who want to pray for you. I just ask now that those people would raise their hands. There are people right around here that if you feel God is doing something in you and you want to go deeper I encourage you to pray for each other the same spirit that's in these leaders that is in you but I'm going to pray and then I'm going to open it up for you to find these people and pray for each other can I say I want to thank those who are taking this seriously enough that stayed in their seats you might actually understand what we're actually asking of you more than some of the people that came forward. And God's not done with any of us. So thank you for your courage not to join this mob because that's actually got a lot to do with the Dunker Punk revolution. Let me pray. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for what you did with that eight. Look at these thousands. Lord, may we surrender to you. We recommit our lives to you. Jesus, we want to experience and undergo your love that we might be found living your radical love. Lord, we don't only want to practice love feats once in a while. We want that to be open table as a way of how we be in the world. Lord, we don't want to wash feet once in a while, but we want to take up your towel in which you've conquered with as our way of conquering in the world. Lord, we ask for the courage to lay down our swords again. We ask for the courage to not talk about a safe pacifism, but talk about the dangerous, revolutionary, enemy love of our Lord Jesus. 
that you so loved us with. Lord, we don't want to talk about simple simplicity, but radical nonconformity with all that looks like cruelty and slavery in this world. So look out on these servants of yours. Look out over these hearts that are open to you and come, Holy Spirit, make this dunker punk tradition a gift to the world again. Make this beautiful story, not just values, not just principles, but an ongoing living response to your Holy Spirit in this world. Come, Holy Spirit, form in us your Son, not to our glory, but the glory of you, Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. What I will ask now is that you will spend, even if it's just a couple of moments, in prayer with the people that you're next to. I feel, and I'm looking for discernment here as I look out at leaders, that God is doing something significant in this place. That God is looking something, I, I see Stan nodding, that is doing something that you will look back in 30 years' time, and this night will be about the direction of your whole life that the future of you as a community and the gift that you are to the world, that the surrender that is present here, if you take that and make that a way of life, if you can find one or two or three that can hold it accountable, you will outgrow like a weed this world to make an impact that you can't even imagine. And here's the thing about the birds. The birds are those that others scare away with scarecrows, the others reject, and yet they find a place to stay here. Like the brother I met walking in here, whose parents are atheists, but one of his brethren mates gave him a Bible while he was in hospital, and reading the Gospels, he said, I want in on this as well. That's the beauty of your tradition. And so I want you to spend two or three minutes, if you want to find these leaders, find these leaders. But the same spirit that is in them is in you. Pray for each other because this is life-changing stuff. This is history-making stuff. It might not be cedar of Lebanon-looking stuff, but this is definitely dunker punk, mustard seed revolution stuff. So pray for each other. Grace and peace. So let me get practical for just one moment, because we've been to camps before, and we've had experiences where we cry and we hug, and for some of us, that's all tonight will be. But I saw it in some of your eyes, some of you are serious, some of you do want to be dunker punks, some of you want to recapture the revolutionary origins of this tradition, and so I want to offer a really easy way to do that. Find one or two people and commit to daily praying Jesus' prayer. It's not about how we go to heaven. It's got everything to do with how heaven's coming here. Learn that prayer. Make it your prayer. And maybe some of us want to join me in trying to memorize the Sermon on the Mount as well. But I'm gonna invite you now, and because I'm a crazy charismatic, I'm gonna ask that you'd put your hands in the air. In a sign of surrender, as we pray in whatever language you want to, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray our Father in heaven, your name is holy. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the bread of your tomorrow and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil, oppression, and injustice. Because Lord, yours is a kingdom, yours is a power, yours is a glory, now and forever, and all God's people said, Amen. So, for those who uh, want to continue a conversation, I'm out there on the wing for half an hour before we hang out with my Irish mates and they lead us in worship, who are flipping awesome as well. So, if you want to join me out there and we unpack some of this stuff, more than welcome. Otherwise, I'll see you in here or somewhere else around 10. Thanks.